after making some mistakes and regretting it later, it's always easier to, to hire slower and to fire faster, but we were better at hiring faster and firing slower. You know, so now we've turned it around and we don't have to fire anymore because we truly have hired the right people. And are we perfect? No, everyone makes mistakes. But if six of us are saying yes and zero of us are saying no, probably a pretty good sign that that person didn't fake the interview and is going to be fitting into our culture and we can help them grow then and be the best version of themselves. This is Lead with Culture. I am Kate Volman, and on this episode, we talk all about culture. That's what we do here on Lead with Culture. <laughs> I was joined by the director of culture at Captivate Exhibits, Brian Magliocco, and we had a really wonderful conversation. I love that more organizations have titles like director of culture because leaders are recognizing and realizing, even though, you know, everyone kind of says they know culture is important, but not everyone is making culture a priority. And so we dug into some of the six immutable principles of a dynamic culture from Matthew Kelly's book, The Culture Solution, because Brian and his team have really dug into that content and have been really intentional about creating a great culture. And we dig into three of them specifically. Number one, which is make culture a priority. We talked a lot about hiring hiring they have done a really remarkable job at ensuring that they're hiring people that not only can fit the role description but also they're a good cultural fit and we got into mission and the importance of having a really strong mission to not only attract really great people but also to help uh, people become more engaged in your organization we talked about all things culture so i hope you enjoyed this episode Brian, thank you so much. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. We're going to have a fun conversation about culture, which who better to talk about culture than the director of culture, which is the second best title other than dream manager, which you have both of those. So <laughs> we do. Yeah, we're very blessed here for sure. Let's dig in immediately since you are the director of culture and you are building a really wonderful culture over there. I would love to hear your definition. Like how do you define culture? Yeah. Well, for us, culture really is the full existence of who we are, right? I mean, the most important thing we talk about is the first thing we talk about with any potential new hires. In fact, the first interview they have to go through after they apply on Indeed or however we get their resume is with myself all about culture and core values. So really, it is the most important substance. It's really not something we do, it's, it's who we are. You know, and it's how we live, how we treat each other, how we interact with each other as employees, but also with our clients too. Hopefully, the way that we treat each other and the way that we live our lives at Captivate Exhibits wears off on our clients. Almost like a, I would say like a pay it forward mentality. Like if we're living and breathing culture, hopefully that wears up on them and then that can wear up on their, their employees, their clients, their families, so on and so forth. So I would say it's more about who we are versus what we do. It's so true because, and I, I love that you also included your clients, like your culture obviously internally is extremely important, but it obviously spills out into your team members how they interact with the people that are doing business with you. If you don't have a great culture internally, likely you're not going to have the great experience that you want to give to each of your clients. And I would say that that is the case. You know, obviously nobody's perfect, right? Everyone has a bad day and well, struggle at times or whatever. But I do feel that because our chemistry here of our team is so intertwined and people enjoy coming to work, which I know is kind of a tagline and Matthew Kelly's book there. And that's what we've truly embraced because we wanted to have it be at the foremost of who we are. And I remember one time Tony came out and spoke to us, I don't know, maybe eight years ago and said, what does your company exist for? And obviously these normal answers are, you know, to make a profit or to satisfy our clients or whatever. And he's like, nope, those are all wrong. Good answers, but not correct. You know, the company exists for its employees. And that always stuck with me and with our leadership team so much so that we we said, we got to change and really allow our culture to percolate from within, you know, then it's everyone's responsibility at a company to participate in the culture, not just from the top down. And I think people have embraced that. And because of it, you know, I think we have clients that appreciate 
not only what we do for them, but who we are and that we want to be a partner with them and not just a vendor of theirs. Can you talk a little bit about Captivate Exhibits and just kind of over the past few years? It's an interesting business. All industries were affected by the pandemic in some way, but <laughs> you guys very specifically, right? Like all the events were shut down. People weren't necessarily looking. Trade shows weren't happening. So that was like obviously a big shift. And so talk a little bit about your experience over the past few years and how culture played into being able to not only stay in business, but obviously get out of that situation and then start to really grow and develop. That's a loaded question for us because, you know, looking back on the pandemic now, four years later, three years later, we see it now as a blessing in disguise. In the time, it was a terrible experience and it truly was a terrible time for our world and our company and everyone involved, right? And some many people lost their lives, unfortunately, because of it. But as we look back on it, we see that we are much better as a company and as people really because of the experiences and the takeaways of, of the pandemic. But just stepping back for a second, so just in case people don't know what an exhibit company is, we are a company that designs and builds trade show displays. We design a custom exhibit for somebody going to a convention or a conference who wants to then, you know, showcase their wares in their booth. And so obviously in 2020, the first quarter of that year, we were going gangbusters and we were on track for having a record year and, you know, just blowing them out of the water, which was awesome. And then all of a sudden, one day in the middle of March, the trade shows just stopped on a dime. And we all remember that day, you know, the NCAA tournament went to no fans, NBA cancels games and then trade shows closed down. And it literally happened like that for us where we couldn't keep up and then suddenly it was nothing. And so it was really a surreal moment, obviously, to have to tell all of our employees that we were gonna have to you know, let certain letting people go. And at that time we thought, okay, maybe this is a two week problem and then we'll move on and we'll be back at it by the summer. Well, obviously trade shows were affected probably for a solid year and a half to almost two years before they finally have gotten back to normalcy. And now they're seeing record attendance at trade shows again. So people want to get back into that face-to-face -face environment. That's what we provide, right? We provide the backdrop for whoever to showcase their products or their services and talk face-to-face -face with their clients. Well, nobody was talking face-to-face. -face. So it was all done on Zoom. And so we kind of went from having uncontrollable business, which was awesome, to no business within a matter of a week. And so that was a crazy time. But for us, and you know, we are a company that puts our, our faith into our mission statement. Our mission statement is to empower people to become the best version of themselves by living our core values for the glory of God. And so by having God in our mission statement, and we wrote that mission, I don't know, probably in 2018, when we started making culture a priority after we had read Matthew's book, The Culture Solution, and we attended his first seminar, you and Tony were at as well down in Florida. John and I, our VP of sales and marketing, went together and we came back, we use EOS. So we, what's called a VTO or vision traction organizer, but EOS struggles at times with culture. They don't talk a lot about it. They're talking about core values, but we said, no, we really need to have a VTO or a strategic plan for culture. And so we wrote one. We actually had a full day off site with our leadership team. We wrote our mission statement. We re-embraced our core values, which have always been geared to our heart. And since then, we've now brought that into our regular VTO. So it's now just part of it because really we can't have our strategy and the rest of our business without our culture first. And so when we were during COVID, when there was nothing else to do, you know, it allowed us to be creative and think of new things, which we did. We actually came out with a line of products called Enclaves, which is like a, almost like one of those she sheds, basically extra living space in people's backyard for whatever they wanted to. I think one of my that I did, because I'm on the sales team as well, was a woman wanted to have an at-home massage parlor for her clients in a kind of a vacation town here in Wisconsin. And so we built one for her and it, the door is purple and it was really colorful and bright for her because she wanted it to be this kind of oasis for people to come and get their massages. But it gave us the ability to be creative, right? But it also gave us the ability to recreate ourselves. Obviously, we had to lay off almost every one of our employees, unfortunately, because there was no trade shows. And then when we brought people back, we kind of created new positions and we brought people back that fit into our culture. And since then, it allowed us to kind of rewrite some of our quality management processes. And we actually made hiring one of our QMS processes. So which is our eight key processes that we always do the same. Hiring is one of those and onboarding. 
none of the other processes are going to work if we don't have dynamic employees. And that starts with the hiring because it's our obligation as a leadership team to make sure that anyone new that we bring in isn't going to affect the culture negatively, but hopefully just enhance it and grow it. And I think that's been our biggest success since COVID is that I would say almost every hire, if not every hire has fit into our culture and has really done nothing but enhance and grow, really just flow naturally into whatever department that they're in. But really, we don't want to just stay in departments here. We're about a team effort. And I feel like our departments, we don't have those silos you know, anymore like we maybe had before COVID and that many companies have. We feel like we're a cohesive team and it's something that we're always working on because nobody's perfect, but I think we have come a long way and we've been very blessed. And that's why I can say now looking back, it's a blessing in disguise because it allowed us to almost become a new company with existing clients that were stored in our warehouse. And once trade shows started, they returned and, and we've had, you know, two very successful years, the last two years. And thanks be to God for that, because we did offer it to him and, and we made it a priority. And I think for that, we've been honored in return. There's so much of what you said that I want to dig into. And before we get into some of the culture stuff specifically, I am curious during that time, and obviously it's easy to talk about it now, right, Brian? You've passed it. You've been there. You did it. You now know the light at the end of the tunnel, but when we're in it, when we are faced with those kinds of transitions in business and faced with that kind of uncertainty, leadership can be really challenging, especially when you have a team of people that are looking up to you saying, where are we going? What are we going to do? Are we going to go out of business? Do I have a job? Like they're questioning all of these things. And so as a leader, how did you communicate to your team? Everything's going to be okay. We're going to make our way out of this. What did that look like? Nobody knew what the heck was happening, right? And where we were going to go. And I think at, at the time we thought, okay, well, we'll weather this for two or three weeks and then we'll just start building trade shows again. Well, that clearly didn't happen. And as the year unfolded in 2020, I think we started to see the writing on the wall that, okay, this is probably not coming back in 2020, maybe isn't coming back in 2021 and maybe isn't going to ever come back, right? At the time, you really didn't know. And so I'm sure we did things well, and we probably didn't do some things well because, you know, we're living in the moment and fearful for our families and, and the livelihood of the company as a whole. But obviously trying to take care of our employees was first and foremost what we tried to do. So getting the PPE money, the two times that it was available was something we wanted to do so we could bless our employees and keep them on the payroll for 60 days or whatever that money allowed us to do. So doing things like that, trying to be creative. We sold a lot of acrylic sneeze shields for banks and hospitals and anyone that would wanted to put the acrylic up in their office. So trying to find ways to keep the lights on, keep people employed. But I think at the end of the day, we were in the worst moment of the pandemic. We probably went from 40 employees before down to approximately seven or eight. And most of those were leadership team members. And some of us, myself included, went to part time because it was the only way we could survive and weather the storm. So were we perfect at it? Obviously not, because we didn't really even know what to expect. But I think as leaders, we grew a lot because we had to rely on each other. We had to rely on God. We had to trust in what we knew and how we could best serve our employees, but any clients that we had, whatever the clients were going to be at that time. And be creative and try to reuse the resources and the skills we had for something else, like the enclaves, like I talked about. So trying to find a way to get motivated to get to work. And I remember at one point, probably during the lowest point, our EOS implementer at our quarterly meeting kind of said, hey guys, there is like zero energy in this room. And he could feel it, obviously we could feel it, but we were kind of at the point of like, this is getting tiring, you know, like how are we going to make it? But that was kind of like, I think the wake up call we needed, because I remember the rest of that meeting that we got creative and that's when we kind of came up with this enclave and that's when we started thinking, okay, what else can we do? So we started launching that we're going to do branded interiors. So if we can build temporary exhibits, we could also come into your office and put a branded permanent history wall in your office or a lobby project or a break room. And, and so trying to think outside the box a little bit so that I'm glad he said that to us. It was not fun to hear in the moment, but he was 100% right. And I think it kind of helped our leadership team say, yeah, no, we got to get behind this and we got to stay focused and, and we will get through it but it's going to be tough. And I would never say it was easy, but like you said, hindsight's always 20-20. Looking back, it's like, oh yeah, we did it. But 
in the moment, it was tough, I would say. Yeah. I think a lot of leaders felt that way, right? Like we were all trying to navigate. No one knew what was going to go on. I think everyone had that moment of, oh, we'll get through it. It'll be a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden it's a year, two years. Oh my gosh. It just turned into, we just never, never knew. But I think it's interesting how you were able to rally the team and to come up with creative solutions. I mean, that's really what's so impactful when you have the right people on your team. And also, I love that you invite third-party people to come into your organization because those are the people that are going to call out that kind of stuff. Like, there's no energy. Where are we going? What are we doing? What are the real challenges that we're dealing with? And because of that, that pushes us to think a little bit differently. Even in the standpoint of coming together and doing like a brainstorm. I always think it's interesting when some facilitators will say, okay, we're only sharing dumb ideas. What's the dumbest idea that you can share? Because it's almost like you're giving people permission to dream big, to think about the most outlandish things that would never work. And while most of them probably would never work, there are going to be pieces that Somebody might have a great idea or it would spark an idea from someone else and they're kind of making different connections. And so I think that's what's really interesting about coming together in a group during that kind of time is like really being able to to leverage the time that you have, which is what you did. So when you were kind of sharing your your journey and your story, there were two of the six principles that really stood out to me as you were talking. And the first one is principle number one, which is make culture a priority. You guys definitely decided to make culture a priority and make it something that was really intentional versus, you know, you guys had a good culture, right? You're family oriented, you have great leadership, and now you've decided to take it to the level of, oh no, but we have to be even more intentional about it. And the second principle that stood out to me was number four, hire with rigorous discipline. You talked about finding those great people and making sure that you're not only finding people that know how to do the role that you need them to do, but that they were also a cultural fit. So how did you edit your hiring process to start including more of those culture conversations so that you knew that you're hiring the right fit on both sides? It's actually started with making mission king. I mean, it's the second principle, correct? That truly is when we were able to turn it around, when we decided, okay, what's going to get us up in the morning? Are we going to get up in the morning every day to build the trade show exhibit? Sure, we can do that, but that's what we do. You know, we came up with our own kind of version of the golden circle that start with the why, which is why we had to have a mission statement. And we kept saying, well, this is what we do, not why we do it. And why we do it is our people, making our people the best version of themselves. and tying in our core values because those are so close to our heart. So that was our, I guess, priority number one. And actually one of the questions I ask in that culture interview, I just give them the mission statement and I ask them, you know, now that you've heard this, what strikes you about that? And you can learn a lot about people and their initial response to that mission statement because I'm not sending it to them in an email and saying, think about the best crafted answer and come back to me. So you kind of catch people off guard a little bit. They're used to, you know, different kinds of interview questions. And here we're asking them things about culture and values and mission and integrity. And um, those are hard questions to answer. And it's hard to fake that. And so I would say that's the first thing that we did was we kind of threw out our interview process or took parts that we liked about it. But then we said, okay, what we needed to do is, first of all, if you've ever done any interviewing or hiring kid, you know that you get about a million resumes. Put it out on Indeed or you work through a recruiter and you get all these people. How do you filter it out? And the first thing is, is we, we kind of narrow it down based on their, obviously their resume, but then we take those people and we say, let's put that aside for right now. And when I interview these people, I say to them, like, what I want to do to you is find out a little bit more about who you are personally and how you tie that into your professional life with your culture, with your values and how that ties into our values and our mission statement. People seem to appreciate that. And the kind of people that are going to want to work here are the people that are going to appreciate that and like that. And so phase one for us was having that culture interview. It's just a phone screening. It takes 20 minutes. I have a series of questions I go through. If it feels like it's going off track, then we end it sooner. And if it's on track, it might take a little bit longer. But those are the kinds of people that we're looking for. And then after that, we have them go through a survey called the predictive index, kind of one of those indexes where it helps measure their cognitive and their behavioral skills. And then if the culture lines up and that lines up, 
Then we bring them in for the interview because our hiring practice describes to the head, the heart, and the briefcase. So we're looking for a well-rounded person that fits those three buckets, the head being kind of the, the cognitive skills, the behavioral skills, which is that predictive index for us, the heart being the culture, the values. You can teach skills, but you can't teach culture. I can't make somebody be a person of integrity, but I can help them be a better carpenter. I can help them be a better salesperson. We can't help them be more in, more filled with integrity. They just have to have that or they don't, right? And then the last thing is the briefcase. What have you done? Where have you been working? What's your resume look like? What are your skills? That kind of thing. So that's the kind of person we're looking for when they go through the kind of in-person interviews, our final interview, and this is our key one, that candidate meets with the entire leadership team, which is a dedication of time. Not a lot of leadership teams would want to give the time and energy to that much. Now, I know some companies listening are probably a thousand employees or whatever, and they possibly can't have the leadership team in on every interview. Maybe you have two leadership team members in on that final interview or figure out a way to be creative in that. But for us, if it's not 100% yes, it's 100% no. And that's the mistake we made before is we would have this interview and then we'd go around the table and four people would say yes and two people would say no. And we'd be like, well, that's a quorum. So we would say yes. But what about those two people that saw something? We all hear and see things differently, right? And so we decided after making some mistakes, and regretting it later, it's always easier to, to hire slower and to fire faster, but we were better at hiring faster and firing slower. You know, so now we've turned it around and we don't have to fire anymore because we truly have hired the right people. And are we perfect? No, everyone makes mistakes. But if six of us are saying yes and zero of us are saying no, it's probably a pretty good sign that that person didn't fake the interview and is going to be fitting into our culture and we can help them grow then and be the best version of themselves. And so that's kind of the process we've drafted and that is the rigorous discipline. We have the same process we follow. Sometimes we're a little bit slow on it and what we're trying to do now is get better at speeding that up, not sacrificing the process, but moving it quicker because there are so many candidates out there and there's only so many jobs and the good candidates are gonna go quick. So we're trying to get better at speed to market without sacrificing our process. What do you think is one of the biggest challenges that leaders have today in building a good culture? That's a tough question because I mean, it's probably different for everyone, right? But I would say what held us back was that maybe a little bit of the fear. What are our current employees going to think when we start to do this or when we start to do that? And I would say if that's kind of where you're stuck right now is that fear of the unknown of what are people going to think, or maybe you're the only one in your company that's feeling this way, but you're at a point like you're a CEO or president where you can make a decision. I would just challenge you to get out there and try it because fear, I think fear is the biggest thing that holds us back in general in life from doing a lot of things. And it holds us back in our dream manager too, because if we're afraid of dreaming, then we're going to not really ever dream properly. And so I think I would say fear of what people may think and how they will respond. And honestly, at the end of the day, if somebody leaves because of a good cultural decision that you make, they probably weren't a good cultural fit in the first place. Those people are probably the ones that are holding your company back from growing both organically with profit and revenue, but also culturally, which you gotta have both. You know, We can't have just a company that's a touchy feely and feel good, but doesn't make any profit. Obviously not. But if you have a good culture, you are gonna end up making revenue and you are going to have good profit because you're going to have people that care. That's probably, I would say, the biggest thing for us in our early days was we were a little bit afraid of what are people going to think of this? And we kind of had to just rip the Band-Aid off. And COVID really allowed us to truly rip it off, you know, all the way and kind of recreate ourselves that way. But I would, you know, without having time to think about that, I would probably throw out that as fear of the unknown is probably for me what I would say. Well, we were talking before we hit record about how you've got a director of culture role, which is wonderful that there's an actual role for that. We have seen more kind of clever names like chief happiness officer or some organizations are being a lot more intentional about making culture a priority. And it's so refreshing to meet leaders like you who are being intentional about it, have a position like this. You also have a certified dream manager. So I wanted to dig in a little bit about how that program is really also helping you with your mission of helping your team members become the best version of yourself. 
I'll start with part one of that first initial question. Yeah, when we when we made culture a priority, when we wrote this mission and this kind of VTO strategic plan for culture, a one year goals was to to make a culture manager, if you will. Um, and at the time, I was also in managing the creative department, which was a four person team that I was in charge of, plus my sales role. So it was a lot more minor then. Since COVID, our creative department has been outsourced, and we use some wonderful partners of ours to do our creative designing. And so that particular role for me went aside, and that's when I was able to embrace this as more of my true leadership role. I would say one struggle for me personally in this role is I don't feel like I have a lot of other culture managers or chief fun officer or any of these types of people to have, if you want to call it a round table or, or kind of be able to connect with, you know, locally here, we can find CEO round tables and CFO round tables and all that stuff. But I have not been able to find a chief culture officer or that type of a position round table. So that's something as that I would love to be involved in. And so I'm speaking to anyone that's out there that is in that role, feel free to connect with me because I would love the chance to pick people's brains and brainstorm and help each other out. But so that's how we were able to kind of transition that. But to kind of speak about the dream manager for a second, that's been something that, um, as I mentioned, John Schlosser, our VP of sales and marketing, he's also our certified dream manager. He came out and was trained obviously by your team, Kate, I want to say it was about seven or eight years ago now. And when he came back, obviously the leadership team was very pumped up about it. But I would say the honest reality is we struggled to get people engaged into the program. We had a few people that were really committed to it. A couple of people that were, myself included, that were somewhat committed to it. Most of our employees didn't know exactly what it was and didn't want to embrace it. However, that was kind of before we had culture as a priority. So we kind of had the dream manager on this island that we were trying to make happen. But culture wasn't necessarily like the driving force of our company yet. Now flip it around to 2024 here, culture has become the priority and the norm here. And it's just what we, who we are and what we do and why we exist. And because of that, now the dream manager is actually excelling because the dream manager actually has a way to be coming from the culture versus the dream manager being the culture. So I think that was something that we learned is the dream manager is a wonderful program but if that's all you're doing for culture, if that's kind of your main thing, it's going to be very difficult to launch it, or at least it was for us this year. So right now we have about 28 employees and we relaunched the Dream Manager this year. And believe it or not, we have 14 people sign up to be in the Dream Manager this year. So that's 50% of our employment signed up this year to be in Dream Manager and about three to five others said, let's keep it on the back burner and check in with me later this year. So if those people sign on too, then that's almost the entire company kind of coming on board in one year. But in my opinion, it's because we led with culture and the dream manager then naturally fits and helps people dream and become the best version of ourselves, which again, ties right back to our mission statement. So I think that's a piece we learned is the dream manager has a wonderful place, but it has to be part of a bigger picture, which is making culture a priority more than just a program, but a way of life. And I think that's kind of how we've seen that take off. And I think, you know, it's April right now. And so we are three or four months into it. So we haven't had enough traction yet to see how it's taking root for people, but it'll be interesting to see how the year unfolds. Yeah, well, I have no doubt that you're going to get lots of really wonderful stories out of that because it is really interesting. We see that some team members, that if the culture is not there, then some people might think, what is this dream manager thing? Why do they want to all of a sudden know about my dreams? And this seems kind of off, right? Like, so it's interesting because when we have a great culture and you have good communication and you have wonderful relationships with your team members and your leadership, then you actually believe you've developed and created a lot of trust so that you know that this program is really for them, they actually have that belief system that, oh, no, they actually are trying to help me become the best version of myself. That is part of the mission of our organization. It's part of the reason that they probably joined the team. And now they're giving me this really incredible opportunity to have a life coach. What? Like, who does that? Like, what organizations are out there doing that? And fortunately, we get to see hundreds of organizations that are doing that today and the impact that it has on their team members. And so I have no doubt that by the end of this year, you'll have even more of your team raising their hand and saying, wait a second, I want in on this because that's what happens all the time is that the people that are going through the program, 
they love it so much that they start talking about it to the team members that aren't in it. And then the team members who aren't get a lot more curious about it. And they think, hey, I might need to, to check out what this whole dream manager thing is all about. So we'll have to have you back on the show to talk about the dream manager. And uh, oh, and John, we can have John join us to talk about the program. That'd be great. He would love it. You know, He was the biggest advocate of them all coming out of that training, which I know really pumped him up. And it was exciting as the leadership team to read the book. They're like, yeah, this does make total sense. And it just wasn't quite the right time yet. You know, it worked for a few people, obviously, but now the time is ripe. And I agree with you. I think we're going to see a lot of fruit this year. And John's going to hear some wonderful stories, obviously, that he can't necessarily share with all of us. But the fruit's going to be there. And hopefully, like you said, we'll hear testimonies from some of our employees that we'd like to get them to share at team meetings and to engage and kind of bring more people into it. And it fits, you know, into another one of the principles, creating the coaching culture, which I think is why it's working now, because we're trying to be better coaches and better leaders. That's why we've gotten rid of our titles of like, management team and gone to more leadership team. because feel that are leading our coaching and mentoring and the dream manager is perfect for fitting into that bucket of that coaching and that mentoring and that I'm um, helping because if they're dreaming, they're allowing themselves to be mentored and coached and they're going to be better people and better employees. It'll be neat to look back in a year from now and say, Hey, here's where we've come because of people dreaming and fulfilling those dreams. Well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your journey over there at Captivate Exhibits and everything that you've been able to do and accomplish over these years. And I'm really excited for you and the future. And sounds like you have a really incredible team that is a great fit. And also just the creativity that is coming out of your team today is really wonderful. So I appreciate you uh, sharing some of those thoughts with our listeners today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Kate. And keep up the great work that you guys are doing over there at Floyd. Uh, thank you. Yes, we're on a similar mission and together we'll help more people, more and more people actually enjoy coming to work and accomplishing great things together. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you got something to use and take away to help engage your team members and build a dynamic culture. And if you are interested in culture coaching and what that might look like in your organization and how we can really help you create a dynamic culture by leveraging the six immutable principles of a dynamic culture, we would love to have a conversation with you. In fact, if you want to know how you would rate your culture, well, you can ask yourself how you would rate your culture, or you can go to our free culture assessment by going to floydconsulting.com slash culture. And you're going to actually be able to have this free assessment where you're going to get a culture score, not only an overall culture score, but you're also going to get a score of each of the six principles of a dynamic culture. So you're going to be able to decide which of those six principles are the main ones for you to really be focusing on right now as you are building a great culture. And uh, and if you're interested in, in what that would look like and how you can take that assessment really much further by having a coach that you're talking to on a regular basis to talk through some of the challenges that you might be going through within the hiring process, within creating your mission, uh, within creating a coaching culture so people feel like they have an opportunity to be seen and valued and heard and do their best work so that everyone in the organization grows and that the organization itself grows. We would love to have that conversation with you and you can go to floydcoaching.com and someone from our team will reach out to you. Thank you again so much for listening. We appreciate you. And until next time, lead with culture.